Thank you, Elder Mark. Happy Sabbath again, church. Are you happy today? Yes. Amen. I'm happy to be here. I know that um, we haven't had church in a couple weeks uh, due to the SoCal Light Camp Meeting, but it's a blessing to be back here and to be worshiping with all of you. Um, I also want to just um, welcome again our guests, our visitors. Uh, thank you so much for joining. If you're a visitor, actually, if I missed a visitor, can you just raise your hand? Okay, we have one there in the back, one in the corner. Oh, my brother that I met, Sokel. Yes, praise the Lord. Uh, we're happy that you're here. And I also want to welcome those who are online as well who are watching this sermon. Um, <clears throat> before I pray, I'd just like to um, start off with an introduction of my topic this morning. Um, this sermon I've entitled, The Touch of a Skillful Hand. The Touch of a Skillful Hand, and this title has, is based on a um, quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, and we'll read that very soon. But how many of you have ever experienced the touch of God in your life? Amen? It is a blessing when God comes into your life in a personal way and interacts with you and touches your heart. It is a blessing. And when we look at Scripture, we find the ways that God interacts with humanity. We see how he loves to engage or, or, or to, to interact with, um, with people, people in the Bible that we, have, that we read through um, each day. Um, and in the Bible, there are several examples. Here we see the example, the first example of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, a verse that I read in a previous sermon, or spoke about in a previous sermon. And it's Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 that says, The Lord God formed the man from the soil of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So here we find that God's touch was involved in creation. And it's a good reminder uh, to think about the fact that when God created um, a lot of what we see around us today, he used his mouth, he used his words. But when he created us, he took some time. Isn't that true? He came down, he formed man from the dust of the ground, then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So touch was involved in creation. God uses his touch for transformation as well. We find in the scripture, Isaiah chapter 64, and verse 8, it says, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. So God is also involved in the work of transformation. He, 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 he loves to mold us, to shape us um, according to his image, as we had learned in a previous a sermon I had just shared, and he uses that he uses his own very hands. Praise God for that. What a blessing to know that his hand is involved in our transformation. We also know that God, uh, when he touches things, they also can be restored. His touch is involved in restoration. We know in Matthew chapter 8, there is a powerful story of a leper who was suffering th this disease for a lot, suffering with this disease for so long. And we know that, that leprosy was a dreadful disease. It was one where if you had it, you had many sores, it was painful, you lost your limbs, you lost your fingers, your toes, some had lost their nose. It was, it, it was just a dreadful disease. But we find here in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 3, when Jesus came in contact with this leper, <clears throat> the Bible says, then Jesus put out his hand and did what, everyone? Touched him, saying, I am willing be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed. So even though this man struggled with this disease for so long and perhaps tried to find help in various ways, we find that when he came in contact with Jesus, when Jesus reached out and touched him, and by the way, did Jesus have to touch him? No, we know that he could heal with the word of his mouth. But yet we see that Jesus reached out and touched the leper. And by the way, back in those days, you did not want to touch a leper, right? They thought that leprosy was contagious, that if you touched the leper, you would become a leper yourself. But here we find that Jesus reached out to this man, touched him, and immediately his leopard, leprosy was cured. We also know that when God's hand is involved, there is protection. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, the Bible says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Amen? Amen? 
Jesus said to himself that if we are in his hands, no one can take us. No one can snatch us from his hands. So in the hands of God, there is protection. And not only that, we know that when God touches, he can qualify individuals. When, touch, when God's touch is involved, there's qualification. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, um, we find in chapter 1, uh, Jeremiah is appointed as a prophet of the Lord. And to be called a prophet, that prophet that is a high calling, isn't it, isn't it not? And Jeremiah was given that privilege to, to be a mouthpiece for God, to speak on his behalf. And we find here in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible reads, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said, uh, Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And that was very comforting for Jeremiah to have this experience because, you know, just like anyone else, Jeremiah didn't feel like he was qualified. He didn't, he didn't think he was cut out for this, for this work. But God is the one who qualifies the called. Amen? Amen? And what a blessing that is. And, you know, this is really what I want to focus in on this morning. I want to talk about um, how God can qualify us to do his work. Because oftentimes when we are in church, we're sitting in the pews, and we hear a preacher or an elder speak and speak on how we should do the work of God, how we should do evangelism, it's very easy to look at ourselves and think, oh, I am not qualified. I can't do that. I didn't go to, to theological school. I didn't, I didn't even attend any Bible studies. I'm not prepared to do this type of work. But I want to tell you today that no matter where you are in life, no matter how much you know, you know, even if you know um, just a little bit about the word of God, that God can use any one of us for his work. Amen? Amen? Because again, God qualifies the called. And so today I want to just encourage us this morning. Encourage us not to be afraid to work for the Lord. Here's a little picture. I actually have a picture of this at home. One of my favorite pictures because it's a picture of Jesus extending his arm uh, to Peter. To Peter. And he's, he's reaching out. And that's, that's the image I have of Jesus often. That when I'm struggling, when I'm going through a, um, maybe a depressing time or I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with my emotions, I can always imagine Jesus extending his arm to me, willing to take me up and to encourage me. And I hope that that is the picture that you have as well. That when you are feeling like you are, oh, sorry, <laughs> you take a picture. Um, when you're feeling like you are discouraged, when you're feeling like you need to reach out to Jesus, you can. You can reach his hand, and he will pick you up, and he will use you again. Praise God for that. With that said, I'd like to get right into my message. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your church. We thank you so much that we are able to be here. Just being able to arrive at this church is a blessing because it reminds us that you have protected us as we traveled here. You have kept us safe. Your hands are with us. And Father, this morning, I pray that your hand would continue to be with us as we delve into this morning's message. I pray, Father, as we talk about the touch of God, the touch, that skillful hand, I pray that, that your hand would touch our hearts, would touch our mind, would touch me as the speaker this morning, that you would help us, Father, to be encouraged this morning and to know how we can be used by you. We thank you so much for all that you do for us, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The touch of a skillful hand. You know, when I think about the touch of God, I can't help but think about how Jesus had a personal touch with his disciples. Right? And who were these disciples? These disciples were just these ordinary men who lived normal lives and our common lives, and they were just, they didn't go through any form of rabbinical school. They didn't, um, they didn't have any formal training. Um, these disciples were just, some of them were fishermen, some were tax collectors. Um, you know, they were just your normal, everyday individuals. But yet we find when Jesus Christ comes down and he spends time with these men, he is able to change these, this, this group of men to be a special group of men. Isn't that true? He's able to utilize them. He's able to use them in such an incredible way. And we read that through the Gospels, but we all especially read that in the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, 
um, we find that Jesus tells his disciples, or he gives them instruction. He provides with them a promise, right? That something is to come and they are to wait for it. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, the Bible reads, While he was with them, Jesus, he declared, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for what my father promised, which you heard about me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so this was the promise that Jesus left with them. And what a blessed promise this was for the disciples. Because as, as you know, the disciples were a little bit discouraged that Jesus had to part ways with them. They were a little afraid as well because now that Jesus is leaving, he's in a sense passing the baton to them to continue his work. And so the disciples were a little bit fearful about that. Some of them had doubts. Some of them felt unqualified to do what Christ was asking them to do here. And so he promises them that the, the Holy Spirit will be poured out upon them, but they are to wait for it. They are to wait for it. And did the disciples do that? Did his followers do that? Absolutely, they did. And as a result of them waiting for the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit was poured upon them in incredible measure, and they were able to do God's work powerfully. They were able to win souls, they were able to preach, they were able to be spirit-filled as they did it. And so um, the early church, as you read in the book of Acts, they, they were able to basically change the world upside down, isn't it true? They were able to witness for the truth, and so many souls were saved as a result. And we have various stories in the book of Acts of how the Holy Spirit moved through the church. But in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, I would just like us to focus on this one. And it's a story of how Peter and John came into contact with a man who needed money. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And when the church gets there, if you can let me know by saying amen. Amen. Oh, you're quick. Praise God. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. The Bible reads, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time for prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So here Peter and John are faithful in going to prayer meeting. They're heading to this time of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The Bible continues on to say, And a man lame from birth was being carried up, who was placed at the temple gate called the beautiful gate every day so he could beg for money from those going into the temple courts. And we see that on occasion, right? When you're going to the grocery store, where you're going to the bank, uh, you might see certain individuals who are asking for money, right? Needing some change, spare change, needing, uh, needing money to get gas, right? And, um, you know, when I read this, I'm just reminded of the fact that, you know, sometimes you know, at least for me, I know that sometimes I hesitate to give, right? Because you, you wonder what they're going to use their mo the money for. You wonder um, if your act of kindness is actually going to do something for them or if they're going to use it for something else that may, maybe not, may not be good. But, you know, here in this instance, we find that Peter and John, when they see this man in need, they respond. But it's interesting. They don't give him money. Notice what it says in verse 3. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple courts... He asked them for money. Peter looked directly at him, as did John, and said, look at us. So the lame man paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said the following, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene stood uh, the Nazarene stand up and walk. Then Peter took hold of him by the right hand and raised him up. And at once the man's feet and ankles were made strong. He jumped up, stood and began walking around and he entered the temple courts with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God and they recognized him as the man who used to sit and ask for donations at the beautiful gave the temple and they were filled with astonishment and amazement at what had happened to him. How powerful is that? This man would always be at that gate asking for money because he had a need, 
and you can imagine how many people, there's probably a countless amount of people that passed him by, didn't think they can help him anyway. But here's Peter and John, because they were filled with the Holy Spirit, because they were impressed, they come up to him and they give him something that is greater than money. Because they didn't have any gold or they didn't have any money on them, right? But they said, though we don't have money, Peter said, I, though I don't have money, I can give you something that I do have. And what is it that they gave him? They gave him Jesus. And that's so powerful to think about. And there's something that we can take away from that story, and it is this, that you cannot give something you do not have. Isn't that true? You can't give something you do not have. Peter and John were able to give Jesus because they had Jesus in the heart. They had Jesus in the heart. I have no silver or gold, but what I do, I have. Uh, what I do, I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ and Nazarene, stand up and walk were his words. You know, I think that many of us can be like this woman in this picture, right? Where we see a lot of people passing by and we feel a little discouraged. And as a Christian, we could be like this woman just thinking about all the, 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 the people we could reach for Jesus, but we, can't re we, we feel like we can't reach them because we don't feel we're qualified. We don't know what to say. Have you, ever, have you ever been on a plane and you feel convicted by the Holy Spirit to speak to the person next to you, but you didn't do it? Has that happened to you before? Or a bus stop, or maybe you're at a grocery store and you have this amazing interaction with somebody and they're talking about something spiritual, but you feel like you just don't know how to, how to connect or how, how to, to, to share something spiritual back. I know this is me often, you know, even, even as a pastor, even as someone who preaches in the front often, I still get nervous. And sometimes, the, I mean, there are moments in my life where I, I wish I could have said something or I could have done something. But you know, you don't have to feel uh, discouraged. You don't have to feel like you have failed God. You don't have to feel like uh, there's no hope for you because again, this message isn't to encourage you, amen? I'm here to encourage you, to remind you that you don't have to be sad and gloomy about the fact that you didn't reach out to that person this past week. But I want you to be encouraged to know that right now, even as I'm speaking, Jesus is extending his arm to you and he wants to empower you to do his work. The question is, are you in touch with God? Are you in touch with God? Because if we are connected with God, then we can actually connect well with others. Amen? To connect well with others, Okay, Sorry. that's okay. My battery is low. <laughs> Hopefully it will make it through the sermon. But in order for us to connect effectively with others, we need to first be connected with the Lord. Listen to what that says in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Our, um, our, uh, yeah, I don't know where my cursor is to take that low battery uh, notification out. But Acts chapter 4, verse 13 says, Now when they saw... This is, again, talking about Peter and John, the boldness of Peter and John, and perceive that there were what, everyone? Uneducated and untrained men, they marvel, and they realize that they had been with Jesus. You know, when we read through the book of Acts, we read through these apostles, it's sometimes easy to forget their past, forget who they were, where they came from. But these men, Peter and John, were un uneducated and untrained. But because Jesus had a touch in their life, because they had an encounter with Jesus, because Jesus was able to take them by the hand and train them, they were able to do incredible things for the sake of the church and for God. When I was, um, when I was first converted into the church, well, I've always been a Seventh-day Adventist, but when I uh, took Adventism seriously, when I took God seriously in 2007, um, you know, before my conversion, I was just a young person who lacked purpose and I lived recklessly, right? I just did whatever I want. I didn't really know what to do. I didn't know um, what God's mission was for my life. I, you know, even though I grew up in the church, I, I kind of just zoned out all the time to the preachers and to the people giving Bible studies. And so I was just a young person who didn't really know what I was doing. And so when Christ came into my life, and he changed my life at an evangelistic series back in Loma Linda, or down there in Loma Linda. I remember accepting Christ into my life and thinking to myself, what now? Right? What now, Lord? 
what, what, should I, what, should, what should I do? You know, I, I had this powerful experience with Jesus. He touched my heart. He pricked me. He convicted me of my sin and also encouraged me to serve him. But here I am as a young person not knowing what mentor to turn to or who to talk to. And I just had all these questions. And I was just asking God, what should I do? Now, praise be to God, he led me to a few individuals who were able to give me Bible studies to educate me in the Word of God. Um, I also was able to pick up a book called The Great Controversy, powerful book, a book I encourage even young people especially to read through that book because that book just, just shows us exactly what we, are, what we are need to expect ahead of us and how we can be involved, what we should be doing before Jesus comes. And after reading the, through the Bible, after reading through the great controversy, God was showing me that even as a young person, he can use me. And so I, uh, I joined this revival team, um, this ministry um, called Finish the Work, and I joined this, this ministry not knowing what I was doing, um, but a mentor friend of mine said, just, just join us, come with us to these church revivals, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how to do it. it. It is not as hard as you think, it may be stressful, but trust in God. He will equip you. He will provide you the words. Just, just trust. And so he took me by the, 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 the wing, in a sense, or the arm by, uh, by the arm, and he started to train me. And uh, he started off by asking me first to do small things. So when we did um, a church revival actually up north in Sebastopol, I remember he asked me to give a welcome for the church, to be in charge of the welcome. And um, I hate, I, back in those days, I hated public speaking. I don't like public speaking even today. <laughs> but it was, I was just, I'm an, I'm an introvert, naturally. And so to stand up in front of people, to stand behind the pulpit, and to even give just a few words of like a, like a welcome, it just made me nervous. And I remember when he asked me to do that, like I had to, I had to really like write down what I was going to say and memorize it and make sure I had it. And you know, little, little, little by little, uh, my mentor friend just asked me to do little things. Be able to do the welcome. After that, you know, participate in the, in the praise, praise singing. After that, I'm going to ask you to do a testimony. And so little by little, he was asking me to do these things until eventually he asked me to present the message. And again, I was terrified. I didn't know what I was doing. And then I just trusted in God and God gave me the words. The reason why I want to share that is because if I, if God can use me, right, to, to do ministry for him, I trust he can use anybody. I trust he can use anyone because I was, I was a nobody. I had nothing going for me. I was just a young, reckless individual. And, but God saw my potential and he worked with me. And a result of him working in my life, I mean, I'm still shocked today that I'm a pastor. I'm like, how, why am I here? Like, God, how did I get here? You know, but God is so good, amen? God is so gracious. And when we take the word of God and we go and do this work, he promises that he will be with us. And I resonate with Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, which says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. When you allow the grace of God in your life, when you allow God to touch you, he will be able to use you in a powerful way. Praise God for that. Desire of Ages, page 250. Wonderful quotation. Hopefully my laptop lasts. But it says, in the common walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called to action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. It says the touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant and uncultured. They had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they, thank you so much, had been with Jesus. All it took was the touch of a skillful hand, and I believe all it will take for us today, those of us who feel unqualified, those of us who feel like we can't do that, we can't go to door to door, I can't, I can't share my testimony. Anyone here today that feels like they can't do anything for God, know that if God's touch is in your life, you will no longer be that ignorant and uncultured person. You will no longer be that person that can't do it, but can do it because of God's grace. Amen? 
I remember a story, um, uh, not a story, I remember a personal um, story of mine where I was canvassing um, several summers ago. And um, you know, when you canvass, you, you come, with, come with a bunch of books to people's doors. And um, you have this canvassing bag, and you know, your hope is that they would get one or two or maybe all of the books if possible. Um, I remember I went to this one particular door, this individual um, responds, but he doesn't respond positively. I'm trying to show him the books and he just wasn't having it. And I was just having the di just such a difficult time. I even dropped down to a smaller book called Steps to Christ um, and tried to convince him to, to get the book, but he just, he was tired of me already at that point and he was ready to let me go. In my head, I was um, just praying and I was just asking God, what should I do? How, how can I reach this man? He just, he's just trying to rush me out of here. How can I, can I just, can I bless him a little bit here? And so I, I was praying and um, as I was about to leave, the Holy Spirit impressed upon my heart to ask this man if he would like to pray with me. And so I said, I said, sir, it, I, I understand you're in a, in a hurry. You probably don't want to see me right now, but I would just like to ask, is it possible if I could just pray for you? And for some reason, after I said those words, his face changed, his demeanor changed. And he said, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, yes, um, sure, you can pray for me. Um, but actually, don't just pray for me. Can you pray for my wife? And apparently, her wife, was, his wife was in the other room, and he, she was very ill. Um, and he was worried for her life. And so um, at that moment, and now I'm understanding why he was kind of rushing me out the door. And at that moment, I sympathized with him. I said, sir, yes, let's pray. And so I started praying for him, and I prayed specially for his wife. And as after I prayed with him, I looked up, I looked at his face, and he just was in tears, just bawling with tears, just crying and crying and crying. And he said, son, thank you so much for praying for me. Thank you so much for praying for my wife, especially I know the Lord has heard your prayer. I trust the Lord has heard your prayer. What books do you have? Let me just get, he didn't care about the, he didn't care what kind of books. He just started like uh, getting the books and he gave me a donation. But at that very moment, I, I realized as a Cole Porter that, you know, it, it's not, it, it's, it's not about going to these doors and being ready. You know, I think that, you know, often we think we need to be so well-trained. We have to recite our words. We have to know exactly what to say to individuals, but that's not the case. God actually just wants us to go, to trust him. And just as Jeremiah, when he was received the touch of God and God put his words in his mouth, God will do the same for us too. If we are prayerful, if we're asking God to give us wisdom as to what to say, he will uh, he knows exactly what words to put into our mouth. Um, I've been able to participate in this uh, 40 days of prayer that the conference is pushing out or promoting. And if, I don't know if you heard about this, but there's a mission trip gonna ha that's going to happen in Silicon Valley. Uh, August 30 to September 4, we're going to have people from all of the, uh, the country. Um, a lot of local churches are involved in this uh, that are going to go door to door and hand out literature, great controversies, pray with people. And they're going to do that from... Um, August 30 to September 4, but leading up to that, there's this 40 days of prayer, and I've um, had the blessing of attending, um, and every other day, there's a guest speaker, and Dan Cerns, our president of the conference, he was actually one of the guest speakers, and he shared his story that really touched me. It was a story of him um, on a Saturday morning, just going out for his daily walk, and it was a daily walk, uh, it was a, rit not a ritual, like a yeah, it was something he did every Sabbath where he would just go and just walk and talk with God as he's looking at nature. And um, he's passing by homes. And one, one, at one time, he sees this woman that's outside. I think she's watering her plants. And he looks at her, uh, realizes she's preoccupied. And he was kind of a little busy with his walk. But he says, um, hello, good morning to you, and God bless. And the woman looks over, and she says, oh, it's rare to see someone talk about God so openly, you know? And um, Dan Stearns goes up to him, President Dan Stearns goes up to him, or her, sorry, and starts talking with her. And he comes to find out that this woman um, is a Seventh-day Adventist. But she never was connected to a church. She never got baptized. She received a great controversy about 20 years ago, and she started to read it from uh, from front cover to back, and she read through it, and she was tremendously blessed, and she was convicted, 
and she actually became a Seventh-day Adventist on her own. In other words, she accepted the Sabbath and she, she believed everything the great country said. She believed what the Bible said. And so she started to walk as a Seventh-day Adventist, not really fully understanding you know, what that, what that means. But she became a Seventh-day Adventist. And so the interesting thing is Dan Cerns is talking with her and he's about to go to a church that same morning to preach. And he's like, hey, why don't you come with me to church? Why don't you join your fellow Seventh-day Adventists and worship? And she's like, oh, I would love to do that. And so she ends up um, going, and now I guess they're in the process of working to um, make her part of the family, to baptize her into the church. But isn't that incredible? And the reason why I share that, friends, is because there are people around us, here in Silicon Valley and all, all around us, that are wanting to know Jesus. There are people that want to experience the touch of God in their lives. And we as believers of God, we have the privilege of having had that experience of being touched by God and also connecting them to Jesus so they can experience that touch too. And I want to share this quote to you. Quote to you. This is Acts of the Apostles, page 109. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Prayers and tears and inquiries go up from souls longing for light, for grace, for the Holy Spirit. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. What a beautiful quote. And it is true. I believe it. There are people who sometimes will just step out of their house and they'll just look into the stars and they'll just pray. Just pray. God, I want to know you more. God, send someone to me to disciple me. God, send someone to me to teach me more of the Bible. God, send someone to, to me to pray with me. I don't know how to pray. There are people who are wistfully looking into heaven, wanting to be gathered in. And we have the privilege to do that. We have the privilege of inviting people, of gathering them to the church. Amen? And in order for us to do that, in order for us to be able to be soul winners, in order for us to gather people into the church, we ourselves need to experience the touch of God. We talked about um, the story of Peter and John when they were able to do incredible things for God, bring, up, bring about healing, and they were able to preach and teach. But you know the reason why the apostles and the disciples were so spirit-filled? Was because they went to the upper room. In Acts chapter 1, verse 13, the Bible says, when they had entered Jerusalem, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Why did they do that? Because number one, they remembered the promise of Jesus. And number two, they went there together to pray. And so the reason why this is important, friends, is because in order for us to experience the touch of God, we need to come to him, amen? We need to, we need to put ourselves in position to where we can experience his touch in our lives. And the reason why the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit was because they put themselves in position to experience that touch. And sure enough, they experienced that touch. They prayed earnestly that, 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 that uh, the Holy Spirit would come in, prick their hearts, and, the, and, and spring them to action. And that is exactly what happened, friends. They were able to turn the world upside down for God's glory. And the question I want to leave for you this morning is simple. How are you getting in touch with Jesus? Are you getting in touch with Jesus? Are you being intentional, intentional about wanting that touch with Christ each and every day? I believe that Jesus can touch us in so many ways. You don't have to go to an upper room per se. Christ can touch you as you open up the word of God. Christ can touch you as, you, as he touched me when I was reading the great controversy. Christ can touch you in your corner uh, in the corner of the house when you're just praying and you're just having a, an, an open conversation with God. Christ can touch you when you step into this church. Christ can touch you as you're going out, walking in nature. There are various ways that Christ can touch you, but you need to be intentional about it. We live in a busy world, especially here in the valley. We're, we're so busy with work. We're so busy with uh, maybe, you know, parents, busy with kids, busy with church even. You know, that, that sometimes we, we just go about our day just doing things, but we, we miss out on the blessing of being at the feet of Jesus. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you. My message is very simple. There's no three points here. It's just, just one simple point, and that is, are you connected? 
are you connected to Jesus? And if you're not, my, my appeal to you is to find that connection. Again, there's various ways you can do that. Spending more time. You know the, the Spirit convicts you as to what you need to do. Maybe it's you, you know you're not spending enough time in the Word of God. Don't be afraid to do it. Just, just start. Even if you have to start small, right? Reading five minutes, ten minutes a day. That's okay. Christ will work with you where you're at. Um, maybe you feel like you haven't been praying enough. I know for me, that's why I joined this 40 days of prayer. I really want to enhance my prayer life. I want to spend more time at the feet of Jesus. There are so many ways that we can spend time with Christ, so many ways we can, we, we can connect with him, and he's so earnest to do that, friends, but all we have to do is be intentional and just ask Jesus, Lord, help me to help, help our relationship. Help me to go closer to you. I know you can help me, and I know you can use me, and this community here in Silicon Valley is, is dependent on you touching your church, and so, Father, I want to be one of those who is touched. Amen? Amen? I know I want to be touched. Church, I hope you are wanting to be touched as well. Jesus wants to spend more time with us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you so much. And we thank you that you have placed us here in Silicon Valley. Lord, it's a tough territory. There are people who are closed-minded to anything spiritual. There are people who are too busy to want to talk about spiritual things or even answer their door. But Father, you placed us here for a reason. We are told in Scripture that the harvest is plentiful. And it's ripe, Lord. It's, it's ripe for the taking. And, and we, we just need your guidance. We just need you to first touch us, Lord. To first change us, transform us. Help us to be more like you. And we also pray that by that same hand, you would push us out to do your work. To, to minister to people while we're working to minister to people when we're here, even at church, to minister to uh, our neighbors, to minister to our family. And so, Father, I know that the work will be done. You have promised it will be done. It's the last sign that you're looking, before, looking for before you come. Please help none of us here to lose sight of that. Help none of us here to lose out on the blessing of serving you and being involved in finishing the work. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your time and for encouraging us, Lord, to be servants for you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.